Welcome back to Alolan Summer, and guys, we have officially lived in a world where a variant of Raichu is the single best run I've ever done, and it reigns supreme on the tier list. But we're gonna see a lot of similarities in today's run, and it was a fun process. Today we'll be taking a look at Alolan Ninetales and a Pokemon Red solo run, and let me give you the rundown real quick. As for the stats, there's only one difference between this and its Cantonian counterpart. This version does have nine less attack, but it does have nine more speed, just like with Raichu you, the learn set is where this one kind of stands out. We're back to that generation 8 learn set, and as a stone evolution, there's a plethora of level 1 moves to choose from. Now in later gens, you'd have to get these from the move relearner, but here, I'm just going to be picking and choosing. I'll go into more of my choices soon, but there's a lot of strong choices. As for the TMs, the list for later gens is so long, I'm not going to put it up, you won't even be able to read it. But there are good things like body slam, dig, and the two ice moves, that's pretty much all that's going to be relevant for this run. And before we dive in, let me just say that if you like solo run content, likes and comments are really important to help a channel grow. So if you want to help me out, hit that like button and just tell me your favorite regional variant. We've already done mine with a Alolan Executor and we got a few more coming up, but I'm interested to hear what yours is. It may not be a Alolan, it might be something else, but just let me know. The front sprite, like the rest of these runs, are not my own work. It does belong to Pat Ackerman. He was kind enough to give me permission to use these, so check out his socials. They are in the description. And if you're curious about the rules for the run. I'll toss them up on the screen real quick, but if you want a deeper rundown of my rules, philosophy, setup, stuff that I use, I do have an unlisted video that's in the description as well, because seriously, there's a lot of information in the description if you never look at that. But that's enough talk. It's time to sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's see if this frozen fox plays as good as it looks on paper. For this run, I will be choosing Squirtle, and the reason is pretty simple. I have great answers for all the starters, and Blastoise is just the tankiest. And here, two dazzling gleams will move us on, and we'll talk about the starting move selection a little bit more, maybe some similarities these cross-gen stone evolutions have had. Just like Raichu and Executor, we are picking from the pool of level 1 moves we just talked about. Ninetales is returning two of these moves, and the first one is going to be Nasty Plot. It's just straight up an Amnesia clone. And you might say, hey, why not just use Amnesia? And that's because I did have extra space for moves, and I think Nasty Plot is just cooler. But there's no difference between it and Amnesia. Extra Sensory does make a return from the Executor video. Now given that we are a fairy type, and Kanto has a lot of pesky poison types early, waiting to sink their little claws into us, the coverage is pretty huge for this run. Last up we have Dazzling Gleam. Now Moonblast is the best fairy move. It does more, it's more in line with Thunderbolt type damage. But the 80 base power here with Stab is pretty solid, and I can't really complain about it. The final move today is Ice Beam. This is the reason that the Articuno run was as successful as it was, and I was just kind of licking my chops when I seen that this Pokemon learned this. Now it is worth noting that this beast of a Pokemon could also start off with Blizzard, but after some testing and weighing out the pros and the cons, the extra base damage did not outweigh the 10% less accuracy and the very small number of power points. It's going to be a while on the run before we need to move that strong, and Ice Beam kind of does everything you need it to while lasting twice as long. As for the early game, there's only only one thing I would like to talk about, and that's the fact that this isn't minimum battles up to Brock, and this is where kind of foresight and optimizations come through already in the run. I'm going to be fighting the Light Years Junior Trainer today. Now Diglett does outspeed me, but after that, two straight ice beams do the job, and I hear you barking, big dog. You're saying, why even waste the time here? And let's take a look at Brock, and we can find out. I'll summarize this battle quickly. I outspeed both Pokemon and Ice Beam one-shots them. It's 100% free, but if I didn't do that Light Years Junior Trainer, the Geodude needs a crit to be a one-shot, and I don't outspeed the Onyx. Basically here, the Diglett got its turn, then I Ice Beam twice for a trade-off of making the Brock fight two turns rather than the Geodude taking three total turns, the Onyx taking two, and I kind of already gained back the time, and the extra experience I got kind of puts future Pokemon battles in a better range as 
as well. Now, in a sense, the Lightyear's Junior Trainer battle, it's gonna be the only optional battle you're gonna see in this entire run, and it kind of snowballed us into the heights that this run eventually makes it to, but there is something else I'm gonna talk about. It's a little bit different. Let's talk about this real quick. Some of you may already know, but I usually do three runs for my videos, and uh, ultimately we're refining, we're optimizing, and I always use nicknames that are four to five characters long. Now, you're gonna notice in this run that my name is just Ninetales A, and I didn't notice this mistake until I was at the Elite Four because I was just so kind of tunneled in here. Let me get this out of the way up front because this was something that I learned for myself during this one, but the extra long name had absolutely negligible impact on the final time. Now, if any of you are familiar with speedruns, maybe the bike vendor text glitch, or if you use the universal Pokemon randomizer, there's the fastest text option. I use that for every single run that I do. That means that text enters the screen all at the same time rather than the obnoxiously slow single character at a time. And if you are a, like a solo runner that enjoys watching slow loading text, then by all means use that. And in that situation, like a small character limit on your name makes sense. But for me, I learned that I can actually do longer names for future videos and it doesn't make an impact. Now this is kind of boring and I know I'm risking little Timmy clicking off the video, but it, I needed to address this. The TLDRs, we have no nickname today. And I guess when we make it to the end, I'll let you decide for yourself if it had an actual outcome on the tier list. Just keep that in mind. As for Mount Moon, there's no need for optionals here. In fact, I really wanted to cut out the rare candy, but the escape rope near it is such a time save that you can actually dig in Bill's house back to Cerulean and Red and Blue, and it was just kind of more trouble than it was worth. But I kind of approached this run kind of like Rayquaza. I was really looking to slim things down as much as I could, but there are no extra battles here today, and for the first time in a while, I'm not going to be mentioning the optional super nerd. With the medium fast leveling group, I do arrive at rival number two at a clean level 15, and smart PP usage means that I can go straight here, and we can worry about healing after the fight. Now, I don't even know if it saves a lot of time, but it does feel kind of good. With a few ice beams and some neutral dazzling gleams, this one's really smooth. We have no problems at all here today. As for Nugget Bridge, Ninetales has a really great kit to handle pretty much everything, and if you just use some common sense, you can get past things very quickly. Pretty much everything's a one-shot, but just like Mount Moon, PP management at the end of the route is pretty key. You want at least three dazzling gleams at the end and you'll save yourself a little time when we finally look at Misty. And with all the similarities between this and Alolan Raichu, we get to finally see a little bit of difference. Ninetales has to rely on nasty plot a lot earlier. Now thankfully Staryu gives me some breathing room. I can actually set up two nasty plots and that's plus four on my special and that's what we need to do to avoid any shenanigans like some bubble beam crits and we're just rolling along. Now after that we're taking a look at the dig rocket grunt and you might be wondering why but I gotta call out an optimization here. I actually use a nasty plot for this seemingly insignificant fight. The drowsy has decent special, he's really hard to one shot and I just can't tell you guys how many runs I've done where I get hypnotized and I end up just rolling my eyes in the back of my head as I waste seven turns while I'm asleep and I'm not doing it. Let's get straight into some more of that juicy optimization talk. Now in hindsight this could probably go for Raichu as well but nine Tails current learn set it's so good I just cannot afford to downgrade any moves for body slam and I just simply don't need the old man rare candy today so for one of the first times in my run I'm literally just running uh, through the SS and straight to rival number three and once again I'm gonna be setting up an early nasty plot after I get that annoying little sand attacking bird out of the way now this one just comes down to some simple math the Kadabra and the war turtle are two shots meaning that they would get a turn of their own and then I would have to use another turn so one setup here just makes things faster, but I do end up Gen 1 missing on the War Turtle, which is about 1 out of 256 chance, so maybe this is actually a lucky run after all. As for Surge, once again, we're, we're getting our cup and we're drinking from that nasty plot Kool-Aid. Keep in mind that Raichu didn't really have to start using this move until about the mid game, but just for safety, I set up two on the Voltorb since it has no status moves, and that allows me to one-shot the Raichu, and we snag the third badge. Now we got answers for everything in Rock Tunnel, we can skip over that. We can go all the way down to Celadon. And with elite runs, you want to be as efficient as you can with your one vitamin buy. So it's no surprise that I'm going to go straight to the rocket hideout first. I'm picking up the high money items. And there's not much trouble here, but this was another segment where careful PowerPoint management can save you an extra heal. And when you're done with this one, you, uh, you want at least four ice beams when you're done. This 
is because without healing, I want to book it straight to Erica's gym right after this. There's no extra training, and after humiliating the execute beauty, let's kind of cliff note Erica real quick. And the long and the short of this is that nasty plot is not needed. Ice Beam super effective against grass. I can one shot everything. And this is really helpful to get this out of the way now because Erica, the beauty, and the Mega Drain TM, they just give you a solid amount of money and you can kind of squeeze out an extra vitamin here. Now in the case of this run, I think if you're looking for pure speed, getting all of the TMs on the top floor to sell is very slow. And just like a lot of things, we're only going to be grabbing us some fresh water today and I can still afford five calciums and we're just leaning into our strengths for that. I'm not saying the top floor TMs are a waste of time. I'm just saying they're kind of slow. If you want the fastest absolute time, I am going to be cutting them out of the run if I can afford it. Now from there, there's not much to say about Pokemon Tower. You're always kind of over leveled for this one and considering how the rest of the run is already going no one's surprised and it's even less surprising how the rest of Pokemon Tower goes we can move ahead. Down in the Safari Zone Ninetales can afford to cut out even more things like the optional vitamins. There's a protein there's a carbos here but with 109 base speed and the fact that we're not going to be using a single physical attack in this run it's just a waste of time. I do pick up the full restore here and I think in my last video I was supposed to elaborate on why they're so important so I promise I'm not going to forget today but for now just know that they are important and if things do go off the rails and plans change and things happen that you don't want you can burn one of these just for the full heal of health and status now that the errands are over i'm heading straight over to silph co and ladies and gentlemen just like raichu before it this will be a quick trip generally you get the goodies on the 10th floor but since we can afford to cut out the candy and we don't need the carbos i take the absolute fastest route and go straight to rival number five One thing I loved about this run was the ice topping, and ice beam afforded me the luxury of just getting rid of Pidgeot immediately, and sand attack was never a factor in this run, and that gave me a lot of confidence in my routing. As you might suspect, nasty plot will be at play here, and I do need two of them to get to that precious plus four special. And Growlithe, like always, Growlithe is the perfect Pokemon to set up on, even if we're weak to fire, Growlithe is just that weak. There's only two threats at the end of the fight, and now with that plus four special, they are trivialized, and to wrap things up quickly here it's a clean sweep of one shots and just like that Sylph is done for the run From there, in an attempt to be as efficient as possible, I'm going to head straight towards Sabrina. And there is some tact in this fight. I'm here early and her Pokemon do have high special. I need one nasty plot to ensure the range on the Kadabra. And when that's taken care of, I do set up another one on the much less threatening Mr. Mime. And that just gears us up for another sweep. Now, it is worth noting that Alakazam is not 100% guaranteed to one shot here. But sometimes, guys, I always mention this. You got to roll the dice. You got to take a couple of risks. I still got the one shot. And that's another victim down. Now we can take it down to Fuchsia and it's worth noting that I am kind of using elixirs in spots like this to save even more time rather than visiting the Pokemart. And I've brought this up before but trainers like this juggler are a prime example of time saving. If you're watching somebody else watch closely see if they do stuff like this. I can't one shot any of his Pokemon naturally and he has four of them. Using nasty plot makes this battle go from me using eight total turns worth of moves and each of his Pokemon getting a turn of their own. It goes from that to me spending five turns and only letting his first Pokemon take a single turn. Now if you ever want to do solo runs of your own and you want better times, things like this is what you really need to start thinking about. Because sometimes it's like, hey I got a setup move, I can just use it, but how much do you use it? How many times can you use a setup move before it's not actually saving you time? And that's kind of like the critical thinking you need to do. As for Koga, you might be worried since I'm a fairy type against his poison types, but here's how it goes. Coughing is useless. I do set up one nasty plot and that's the battle over. Extra Sensory super effective damage can now 100% one shot every single one of his Pokemon. And the only thing you need to know about this fight is that I entered this at 60 health and I came out with 63. So it's a net gain. We're done here. Next up, we can take that weekly brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And it's not surprising that there's absolutely zero extra battles today. But as an ice top, it's worth pointing out that I do pick up Blizzard here. And this is kind of the point of the game where that extra base power is worth it over Ice Beam to save just a little bit more time. In my opinion, access to this nuke and just the nature of how strong Generation 1 Blizzard is is one of the huge advantages that this run had over the Raichu run. And as I contemplated that, I also had to think about if Tombstoner, brother, 
was actually the 28th TM, but there just wasn't that much time to waste today, and we can just look at Blaine. And this is gonna be the first of some of these late game fights where Blizzard will save you turns. Without it, you need an additional nasty plot, but that 180 effective power and the fact that fire does not resist ice in Gen 1 means a single nasty plot can transition you into a Blizzard sweep. And look at this guys, we're at a sub 90 minute time. Needless to say, we are cruising. Now it's time for the final gym, and you would think it would kind of be a blizzard show here, but so that I can save an elixir and a heal, I do take a different approach. A single nasty plot can put all of his Pokemon into guaranteed one-shot ranges with only extra sensory, and the only real point of valuable PP I have to spend here is Dazzling Gleam on the Rhydon, and this just lets me comfortably move on directly into rival number six. And even though Sand Attack is no longer a threat, I still just go ahead and I get rid of the Pidgeot because it does more damage than some of the Pokemon I could be setting up on, and Rhyhorn is that Pokemon for this fight. Going back to what I just talked about with Blizzard, this means once again only one nasty plot is needed, and I start to go on the sweep. Now unfortunately, I do miss on the Alakazam, but with the boosted special, it doesn't do much damage in return, and I clean it up from there. And even though Blastoise does take two Dazzling Gleams, it just wasn't worth the extra setup turn. But this one was clean like the rest of this run. No shocker there, we know how this run's been going, it's great. Now the Elite Four is all that's left, and there's a few things I kind of want to say. I don't think the actual battles will be too much trouble, and just like we've seen at a lot of various points in the run, I am going to save some more time by cutting out that Victory Road Rare Candy, and I'm not picking up any extra battles. And I'm finally going to remember to mention Full Restore here. I picked up two already, and there's a hidden third one at the end of Victory Road. And if you have a great run, and you save all your Full Restores, that means you can skip buying them right before the League, and that's just another little time save. Save. and if you've been paying attention this video that's a lot of little time saves they're starting to compound and add up guys the last thing I do is I use all eight of the rare candies this gets us up to a nice little level 54 and now I think we can take a look at the final gauntlet of the run Lorelai's first, and this is where you miss something like Moonblast the most. Dazzling Gleam is our best answer here, and it's a little bit lacking against our tanky Pokemon, so for the only time on the run, Ninetales has to do the most nasty plotting it's done, and it has to fully set up. I didn't need this, but the Dugong does put two Growls on me, and it just kind of boosts us even more, and at this point, Lorelai, she's already lost, she just doesn't know it yet. With 670 special, Ninetales has ascended to deity status, and I can finish this one off swiftly with a series of one shots and just like that we're moving on. As for Bruno, I kind of feel sorry for him. Ever since around Misty we've been kind of utilizing Nasty Plot to get an edge in battles but for the first time in quite a while I don't even need to sip the Kool-Aid. I go straight Dazzling Gleam and Fairy it's not really a great topping in my opinion but it is super effective against fighting tops and that means we get to see a rare Machamp one shot and that's that's the end of this one. There's It's Bruno. Agatha is next, and I do need to set up once, and like always, there's always that tiny potential chance the AI will turn on the cheats, but here, I just take a little bit of damage from Nightshade, and this allows extra sensory to put in some work. It can sweep through the majority of the team, that's not really a surprise, but Blizzard is needed for the final Gengar. It has a really high chance to one-shot it, but here, I don't get it, and at the end of the day, it does just waste a single turn. I'm not really worried about it. This one was pretty consistent. It's enough to where we don't really have to go in depth with it or talk about it anymore anymore. Next up is Lance, and let's get Gyarados out of the way real quick. I do set up one nasty plot, and you can see how it kind of trivializes the Hydro Pump damage, but this does put it into Blizzard one-shot territory, and just like that, the Menace is down for this run. And this is a tangent as I crush through the rest of this battle, but Ice and Fairy always seemed like a redundant type combination to me. Both of their main niches is just to absolutely destroy dragons, and with Nasty Plot, this one's just overkill. It reminds me of the Simpsons clip where where it's like, stop, he's already dead. <laughs> stop, dead. And I think that pretty much sums up this battle nicely as we head into the final battle.
With Alakazam coming up second, I am going to set up on the Pidgeot for the first time in this video, but notice that I only do one nasty plot because this Pokemon is just that amazing. This also lets me use the more accurate Dazzling Gleam over Blizzard to knock it out and move on. Alakazam is next, and I do crit with the Blizzard here, but the nasty plot meant that either way this was a one shot, and you can see how this one's going to end up going. Rhydon doesn't even require a Blizzard, Gleam will do the job, and after that I do have to start relying on Blizzard a little more because Arcanine is a thick puppy, but with 180 effective power and a plus two to our special, it moves us on quick. And speaking of thick, Executor going down to a single move always kind of brings a tear to my eye because this thing's always trouble and it's always really tanky. And when that snowstorm clears, Blastoise is just sitting there. It's the final thing in our way. And just like earlier, one move is not going to get the job done. And for its turn, it simply uses a withdrawal as if to almost say, hey, I concede the match, but I don't let him and I finish him off for the dazzling gleam and put an end to this run. And that's it, Alolan Ninetales has done it. And with a time of one hour, 48 minutes and four seconds, you can see why I explained the nickname thing early and why it didn't matter. This one crushed it. And not only that, it cleared Alolan Raichu's already top time by nearly five minutes. Now sometimes it's hard to tell if a Pokemon is truly that much better or if maybe I had a stroke of genius with the routing, but outside of Raichu picking up Body Slam, maybe being a waste, maybe being a minor mistake, I just can't think of many things that would equate to five Five minutes of in-game time. This run was really impressive and it's just hilarious to me how good some of these Pokemon are performing and it's kind of a testament to how awful the slow leveling group can be. But these stone evolutions really came to play in these Gen 7 runs. I'm, I'm really impressed. As Alola Ninetales gets this official card and we kind of update our tier list, let's roll that out. This is clearly the head and shoulders best run I've seen so far and I know I was a little bit hyperbolic for Raichu as well but I'm seriously just I'm not sure if there's anything that can match this level of run. If there's maybe a fast leveling group or a slow leveling group Pokemon that starts off with amnesia or nasty plot and maybe gets a powerful stab move or two with some coverage, maybe that could do it. But I haven't seen that Pokemon yet, but I am always kind of peeking around. Now next week, we do have a Lolan Marowak up next and it's not a stone evolution. Let me say that up front. You should not have your expectations that high for a fire type in Gen 1, but it is one of my favorite Pokemon. So I am excited nonetheless to do it. And as always, special thanks to my channel members. I do appreciate you guys a lot. It means a lot to me. And if you are still hearing my voice right now, you're a real one and you should write real one down in the chat because I love seeing who makes it this far. But let's keep this one short. I'm still on that grind. I, gotta, I need a backlog of videos. So let's move on to the next and I'll catch you then. Bye.